Um, yeah, so welcome everyone to, to our tutorial on the latest trends in abstraction heuristics for classic planning. Um, this will be a tutorial presented jointly um, by these three people. This is the order of appearance. Um, so I'm, I'm going to speak first to Malte Helmert, then Jendrik Seib will take over for the second part, um, and then Silva and Sivas will, will, will say a little bit. Um, this is really, you know, the presentation is for you, not for us, right? So if there's anything you, you, you don't understand or anything you want to ask or uh, any more information you'd, you'd like to have, just ask at any time. Uh, or if you don't want that or if you have things that only come up later, um, just email us. Um, we will also put these slides online on our web pages. They're not there yet, um, but you can just find them, you know, by, by searching for our names, basically. Um, my name in particular, I think, is, is unique in the world, so it's not very difficult. Um, okay, so we try to aim this at a level uh, where you can kind of get what it is about without having a whole lot of background, but on this at, the same t uh, at the same time, we assume that most of you have a background. So um, there will be some basic introduction, but then we will try to go well, rather quickly into the, to the things we really care about. Um, so the, our target audience, what we kind of have in mind, is that ideally you, you should already know what classical planning is, you should know what strips is, you should know what SAS plus is, who, who satisfies this criterion? Raise your hand. Jendrik doesn't, oh he does, that's good. Um, and you know what planning a heuristic search is, so you've heard about a star admissible heuristics and consistent heuristics, I think I don't even have to ask you about that. Uh, so let's move on to the next one. Um, ideally you should always I also already have a basic famili familiarity with uh, the kind of the foundational te techniques on abstraction heuristics in this context. So you should know what an abstraction is um, and want to find out more about like what, what the new abstractions are that people have been studying in planning. So uh, you should perhaps already know at least ideally what a pattern database is and what a PDB heuristic is. Who, who satisfies that? That's basically everyone, almost everyone. Okay, very good. Um, but again, if there's you know any background you that we're not explaining, you want to hear about just ask questions at every time. Actually, ask a question at this time. How much time did we budget for this first? 20 minutes. Okay, don't tell the others. Just tell me. Okay, thank you. Um, so there'll be four parts. Um, basically, the first three parts will be presented by kind of the three of us, uh, and then I'll come back again for, for, for a quick outlook. Um, and we'll get started with the basic background on planning and abstraction. Um, so planning, <coughs> this is kind of a formal definition. You don't really have to go over, over everything, but I think it's kind of useful to at least briefly see which notation we're using. So we're using these planning tasks in, in a finite domain representation, which we call SAS plus, where we have a finite set of state variables. Each has a finite domain. Um, and we have, of course, we have operators, actions, uh, which, which have preconditions, effects, and costs. And we write them down like this. Um, and sometimes we write down operators as, as triples, so listing the preconditions and the, uh, then the effects and then uh, the cost. Um, and we, we don't talk about the cost if, if, it, if we don't care about it. Usually then we assume it's one. Um, also, we have a fixed initial state, which in states, of course, are just assignments to all the state variables. And we have a goal condition, um, which is basically a partial assignment to the state variable. So every state that agrees with this partial assignment is a goal state. Um, but actually, we see that a bit more formally in a second. Um, <coughs> so the problem we want to solve is finding plans. So we're given such a SAS plus planning task. We want to find a sequence of actions that takes us from the initial state to a goal state. Um, and sometimes, or most of the time, we also care about the quality of the plan, um, either as a soft or a hard constraint. Um, so if we do optimal planning, we actually want only want to find a plan with guaranteed minimal costs. Um, maybe sometimes we don't want to do that, but then we still care about the costs. We would like them to be as low as possible. Um, and this is not really a formal definition because I'm not telling you what a plan is. I'm not even telling you what the cost of a plan is. Um, if I wanted to give you a full formal definition, uh, it ideally, I do that by formally introducing the semantics of planning via transition systems, and often you don't do that. Um, here it actually makes a lot of sense to do that because we'll actually use these transition systems for other purposes too. So let's go over that briefly. Um, so a transition system is, is what also people call a state space. Um, it's essentially a directed graph with some additional annotations. Um, so it can consist of states. Um, there are labels, and the labels correspond to the actions later. Um, and each label has an associated cost. And we have the transitions that connect the states to other states uh, labeled with these labels. Uh, some of the states are goal states. One of them is the initial state. Um, and yeah, as I said, the whole thing is also called a state space. And I guess it's easiest. Um, actually, let's go ahead and then go back to this um, <coughs> to look at this with an example. So this is an example of, of such a transition system um, with a bunch of states shown as, as, you know, as vertices. And you see the transitions here. I didn't show the labels because we don't care about them. The green ones are the goal states. This is the initial state, so this is what a very simple transition system looks like. 
Um, and this is not just any transition system. It's actually the kind of transition system that is implicitly defined by a CES plus planning task. Um, so the planning tasks essentially um, are compact descriptions uh, of such transition systems. So usually you have like, I don't know, a planning task with n state variables, and that would then define a transition system which will have at least two to the n states. So it's a compact description. And basically this slide shows you how you can go from the task to, to this transition system. Basically this gives you the semantics. Um, and of course this is usually kind of a transformation like, like, like going, going from the task to the transition system that you can only do mentally, only do in your head because they will become too big to actually represent them explicitly. Um, so the states are just the states of the planning task in that, in that case. So the assignments to the state variables. The labels are just the operators. And the transitions, basically, this is the interesting part. So you have a transition from some state to some other state. If in the source state S, your precondition is satisfied. If in the target state T, uh, everything is kind of looks like it should according to the effect. And everything, every variable that is neither mentioned in the precondition nor mentioned in the effect uh, stays the same way, um, then, then you'll get such a transition. And of course, I already talked about the initial state and the goal state. So every state that agrees with the goal condition, so that has the same value, as the goal state, uh, as a goal on all variables where that is defined would be considered a goal state. And going back to this example, I'm not going to describe this in detail, but, but Silvan actually will, will come back to exactly this example later. Um, so this is a, a, a transition system for, uh, for a planning task with three state variables. Uh, one of them represents a package uh, and can take on four different values. The other two uh, represent trucks and can take two different values each. So altogether we end up with four times two times two. Uh, which is 16 states, and indeed, this appears to be the case. So I'm going to say a bit more about what, what this actually is later, so I, I won't give you all the details, but maybe just one example. So this here, for example, is a state uh, where the uh, package is on, on at the left location, and both of the trucks are at the right location, and one of the things you can do then is move one of the trucks from the right to the left location, and that could take you to this state. Basically, this second part is what encodes the location of that truck. Um, Okay, so far so good. We didn't say 20 minutes, did we? Okay. Uh, <coughs> okay, I'm going over this rather quickly, but this is good because the others have, have quite a bit more meat in their presentations. This is mostly the basic stuff that you already know about. Um, okay, so that was just planning. Now we actually move into like the particular uh, approach or particular class of techniques for planning that, that we want to cover today. Um, so I want to briefly give you uh, like an introduction to the concept of abstractions. And why are we interested in abstractions? Well, because we want to find the solutions to planning tasks. And, and one of the very popular ways of doing that uh, is to use heuristic search algorithms, um, such as A star. Um, and then you want a heuristic. So if you want optimal solutions, you, you actually want an admissible heuristic. Uh, you'll know what that means. Heuristic is something um, that takes the state and gives you an estimate of the cost of reaching the goal from that state. Um, and we call it admissible if it never gives you an overestimate of the true cost. Um, and abstraction is one particular way of coming up with such heuristics. It's not the only reason for studying abstractions. You can, you know, you can do different things with them, um, but that's maybe the most common one, also one of the ones that's simplest to understand. So this should be enough to motivate why people could be interested in abstractions. Um, now, what is actually an abstraction heuristic? An abstraction heuristic is a particular kind of heuristic. Um, I should emphasize that um, if you go to different communities, even within AI, people will use some of these words differently. So in some communities, abstraction is used as a very generic term for, for all kinds of kind of simplifications of problems. Um, here, and for the most part in the classical planning literature, when we say abstraction, we mean something um, quite, quite precise, quite, I don't want to say limited because it's rather general, but quite specific. Um, namely, <coughs> an abstraction is, is basically something that maps a state space into a smaller state space in a particular way. Um, and an abstraction heuristic it's then a heuristic that is based on su such an abstraction where you get the heuristic estimate of a state by basically looking at what is the corresponding state in the smaller abstract space, how far away is that from the abstract goal, and then taking that as your heuristic estimate for solving the problem we actually want to solve. Um, and how can we formalize that? Well, an abstraction is just any function basically defined on the set of states. Um, so if you have a transition system with states S, then any function that maps S to something else, we call it S prime here, um, is an abstraction. So the, the idea is basically that alpha will, will give us the abstract state that corresponds to a given concrete state, for a given state of the, the transition system we want to abstract. Um, and yeah, so formally you don't need to require more than that. Um, <coughs> and the idea basically is 
um, that alpha tells us which states we want to treat differently in the abstraction, which ones we don't. So if we have two states that are mapped to the same abstract state by alpha, uh, then basically they will be the same in the abstraction. So in the abstract uh, transition system, you can't distinguish them. Um, and rather than kind of thinking of this as a function, it's often quite useful of thinking about it as a kind of equivalence relation between states in the concrete state space. And sometimes we'll use this notation, so the state will be equivalent under this abstraction alpha if and only if it's mapped to the same plane. Um, and yeah, I think this is kind of the most basic background, and I've been kind of going over it rather quickly. So if there's anything unclear at this point, it would be good to raise your hand now, um, because this is kind of, you know, the, the, the foundation of what is to come. Um, <coughs> okay, seems that everything is, is clear enough. Uh, then we can make a bit more formal how this process of abstraction actually works. And it works in a kind of very simple, almost, almost trivial mathematical way um, as, as a mapping on, on uh, the transition system. So basically what you do is you apply your abstraction function to everything. So you have a, a concrete transition system with the various components, states, labels, transitions, initial state, goal state. And you have an abstraction on that. Um, and that gives you uh, what we call the induced abstract transition system, which is another transition system. So it again has states and so on. Um, and its states are basically all the images that you can get under alpha, so everything that alpha maps to. The transition labels are just the same, nothing changes there. Um, and basically transitions are produced by taking all the transitions that you have um, and applying the abstraction to the involved states. So if S, L, T is a transition, then you get alpha of S, L, alpha of T. And basically, for the initial state and the goal, it works the same way. Uh, and once you have that, you can define uh, the abstraction heuristic on your original task. Basically, the heuristic value for a given state s is what you get if you take alpha of s, um, check like, the distance to the closest goal state in this abstract transition system, and well, yeah, so that's your, abs that's your heuristic value. That's what it's about. Um, so here's one example of the, of the uh, transition system I showed you before. Uh, let's assume that all the actions, all the operators have a cost of one. Um, so kind of in, in gray in the background, you see the original concrete state. So this kind of visualizes the mapping. But the abstract state space actually only consists of four different states, basically the, the, the big boxes here. So for example, all these four original concrete states are mapped to one abstract state. Uh, those four are mapped to another. Those four are mapped to another. Those four are mapped to another. And then our definition gives us basically what the abstract transition system looks like. It looks like this. Um, and we can see that, for example, for the initial state, the heuristic value would be 2, um, because the shortest path from here to the goal is, for example, taking this transition, then this transition, and that's the total cost of 2. And of course, that's an uh, approximation. Why is it an approximation? Because we, we lost some information about the original state space by, by losing the distinction, for example, between these two states. Basically, what this particular abstraction does is it kind of pretends that the trucks are everywhere at the same time. So this abstraction kind of loses the information that you have to move the trucks around. OK. Um, now, the last thing I want to talk about before passing, passing over to um, Jendrik um, <coughs> is kind of a hierarchy of different kinds of abstraction functions that people have studied. Um, and yeah, let's just go into that directly. Um, so in theory, you can basically use every function as an abstraction function. Like mathematically, you're not limited. Um, but of course, certain cho choices don't make a whole lot of sense. For example, you can map everything to the same abstract state, but then you get a terrible heuristic, which is always 0. Uh, or you can choose, uh, just use the identity function, map everything to itself. Um, but then your abstract state space is as difficult to search as the original one. Um, and so you haven't really gained anything either. Um, and these are kind of two, two opposite ends of a spectrum. So what you usually want to do is you want to obtain a heuristic which is informative, and that usually means you want a rather fine-grained abstraction where you don't aggregate too many things. So that's the one aspect. But on the other hand, you want to get something which is rather small. You want to end up with an abstract state space in particular which doesn't have too many abstract states. And you kind of have to keep the representation that tells you how to get from a concrete to an abstract state, kind of your alpha. You can't store that as a function, right? You have to have a, a, a concrete representation, a, a compact representation of that. You have to keep that small too. And th this is kind of the main trade-off. And this is where it gets inter interesting in defining abstraction functions. Um, so we will be interested in abstractions that have small representations. And for us, this means we want to have few abstract states. And there's a little asterisk there. So this is not really a strict requirement. There are abstractions that have many states, but can still be kind of handled efficiently. Uh, there are some experts on that in the audience. Uh, we'll get back to that at the very end. But it's not something we will really cover. Um, 
So we always have explicitly represented abstractions, and therefore they have, must have few abstract states. By few, I mean they must fit into memory, main memory in our case. So usually not more than a few million. Um, and also you must be able to succinctly encode the representation uh, of alpha, because otherwise in a given state you don't know what your corresponding abstract state is. Okay. And um, here's, let's say, the most popular kinds of abstractions that people have, have, have studied, uh, kind of increasing order of, of generality. Um, so the most commonly studied ones, but also the ones that kind of give you um, the least amount of power are so-called projections. So these are the abstractions that underlie pattern databases. Um, and then you can go basically one level up and you end up with what is called domain abstractions. Um, from there, you can go another level up and end up with what, what is called Cartesian abstractions. And then kind of the final step in, the, in this chain uh, is going to so-called merge and shrink abstractions. And I'll give you some, some brief ideas of, of what all of these are, but really very briefly uh, on the next few slides. And then we'll go into a bit more detail on kind of the current state of the art for kind of the last two techniques. So this will be what, what Jendrik will talk about. This will be what Silvan will talk about. Um, and OK, so the example I will use kind of to illustrate the abstractions is a, a simple problem with no particular meaning, which has two state variables. And because it has two state variables, you can illustrate it kind of as a, as a grid. Um, so you have one variable corresponding to the rows, which can be either A or B or C. And you have one variable corresponding to the columns, which can be 1, 2, 3, or 4. And, for ex and what you want to do is you want to go from here, the initial state, to the only goal state down there. And if you look at the details of the operator label, so this is actually, it looks a bit odd, like with this, this part down here that cannot be reached, but formally that's there. And that's actually the kind of abstract state you can get from a SAS plus planning task. So it has kind of the structure that this must have. For example, um, there's kind of these parallel arcs with O1, and that's not a coincidence. It has something to do with, with the kind of the things you can write down in SAS plus. Okay, um, so the simplest thing I said that we would consider are so-called projections. So what a projection does is it only looks at a subset of the variables. And for the variables it doesn't look at, basically, uh, it throws them all together. It considers them all equivalent. So in this picture, it means, basically, we only look at the columns uh, or we only look at the rows. So for example, in this case, we have a projection um, where we do, don't look at the variable that gives us the ABC. We only look at the variable that gives us the number, which means we end up with only those four abstract states. So basically, um, yeah, you, you, you throw away, if you th this is kind of like a 2D thing, right? So you throw away certain dimensions of your problem. And so it makes a whole lot of sense to call this a projection also in the geometric sense. Um, and yeah, so these are the kinds of abstractions that are the basis of pattern databases. Um, or at least I should also emphasize seeing, for example, Rob in the audience, again, not all terms are used the same way in all communities. So in, in, in other communities, people often also use um, general classes of abstractions and still call the resulting uh, representation of the heuristic a pattern database. In, in, in planning, it's become kind of common usage to say it's a pattern database if it's a projection, and if it isn't, then we call it something else. But of course, you know, I mean, everybody can define the terminology the, they, the way they want, but that's how you'll find these used in the planning literature for the most part. Okay, so you can be a bit more general than that and basically say, I'm not, I don't want to throw away certain variables completely, but let's drop the distinction between particular values of certain variables. And that's what we call the domain abstraction. So for example, for the first variable here, or for, well, for the ABC variable, here we drop the distinction between uh, A and B, and for the other variable we drop the distinction between 1 and 2, and we drop the distinction between 3 and 4. Um, but the thing about these domain abstractions is that um, this is kind of the only thing you do, so you don't track any kind of particular dependencies between different state variables. So you, you define what the abstraction does on the level of individual state variables. So if you think about this geometrically, this is kind of what you can get if you, I don't know, take a knife and kind of slice through your state space in a very regular way. Um, and then the next level up in a hierarchy would use kind of the same kinds of rectangular abstract states, but you don't have to make them quite as regular. So here, um, this is an example of what we call a Cartesian abstraction. Cartesian abstractions, again, only have um, abstract states that kind of correspond to, to products of values of uh, individual state variables. Um, but for different regions of the state space, you can do this in a, in a different way. So for example, over here, we don't distinguish between 3 and 4, but down here we, we do. And this is what we call a Cartesian abstraction, if you're interested in how to come up with these in a good way. So this is what Jendrik will talk about. Um, and finally, we have the so-called merge and shrink abstractions. Um, <coughs> and for these, it's actually not quite as easy to give an example in terms of what the abstraction looks like. And the reason for that is that merge and shrink abstractions can actually represent every abstraction. 
uh, only some of them can be re represented more compactly than others. Um, and that will basically be the thing that, that Sylvan talks about. So I just try to illustrate here that you can kind of combine things in arbitrary ways by having like slightly you know, more odd shaped things. Um, and in this particular case, this is not just any abstraction. This is actually uh, kind of the most compact way you can get the perfect heuristic for this, for the relevant part of the state space. And it's also the kind of abstraction you would get from one of the techniques that, that Sylvan will talk about called bisimulation based shrinking. Um, and there's a question over there. Yes. Yes. Um, in, in the, sorry, so, so at that level you don't really have Rosa columns anymore. Um, so what we have here is we have, let's, let's come, so this is one abstract state corresponding to those four original states. This is another abstract state which actually only corresp corresponds to a single concrete state. So if we want we can just, you know, give the abstract states names, we can call them S1, S2, S3, S4, S5, S6, S7, and that's what we get if, we, if our abstraction says alpha of A1 is S1, alpha of A2 is S2, alpha of A3 is S, uh, sorry, is S1, alpha A3 is also S1, and so on. Um, well, at the level of the abstraction, they don't really, they don't exist anymore. Uh, they do exist at the level of the strips representation on which we will, uh, sorry, the SS plus representation uh, on which we will construct the, the, the abstractions. Uh, and they will be quite important for kind of which kinds of abstractions we can get easily, which ones we can't. Um, so at the um, at that level, basically, um, they correspond. The different dimensions correspond to the state variables. So we could have one state variable, let's say R for the row, and its domain would be A, B, C, and one called C for the column, and its domain would be one, two, three, four. And these will kind of reappear as transition systems in a way in, in Sylvan's presentation, so that he, that he will call them atomic transition systems, but that's kind of uh, jumping ahead a little bit. Okay, so I managed to... Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. So the thing is exactly um, that, that this, is, this is part of the problem, really, because, of course, if, if you do, for example, if you combine A1 and C4, uh, what you get is something that gives you a heuristic value of zero of the initial state. So the main question is, if you have all this freedom of coming up with any abstraction you like, how do you do that automatically in a way that gives you something useful? How do you kind of guide these choices? And that will be one of the main focuses of what Sylvan will talk about. Okay. Are there any further questions before I pass over? Otherwise... Um, Yes. Although, of course, I mean, at least not necessarily Cartesian abstractions because they're a special case. Yes. Okay, so now that Marta has showed us how um, the different kinds of abstractions we can get, um, we uh, are the kinds of abstractions there are, of course, we want to see ways of coming up with these abstractions. And one way is to do um, Cartesian abstraction refinement that uses uh, the cigar approach, which means counterexample guided abstraction refinement. And uh, I will show you this approach, and uh, you will see how we quite naturally um, land in a Cartesian abstraction with this approach. Uh, then I will show you how we can um, group many of these abstractions together and um, combine their heuristics uh, estimates by summing over them and still staying admissible. And then I will show you how we can diversify the, um, a task and to produce diverse abstractions um, that produce even higher summed estimates. Okay, so let's start with uh, the Cartesian abstraction refinement. Let's consider an even simpler example uh, than the, the one before. There's only one truck and one package now. Um, but I have to say that our approaches work with even more trucks. For example, three or four, we, we solve these. Um, okay, so obviously, uh, again, we have this rectangular um, visualization. We have the truck uh, that can be either in uh, the left location, in the middle. Uh, um, oh no, the truck is uh, obviously on the uh, y axis and can be either on the left side or on the right side. And the package can be either on the left side in the truck 
or uh, at the right side, and we want to move the package from the left side to the right side. So the question is, uh, how can we abstract this task? And in uh, counter example guided abstraction refinement, the approach is simple. You uh, just start with the coarsest abstraction that you can think of, namely you map all states to one single abstract state. Uh, as Malte said, then you have a heuristic estimate of zero, so you shouldn't stop there. Um, but the um, approach works iteratively and checks, uh, finds an uh, abstract solution, then checks if this works in the concrete state space. And um, let's do this. So if we are already in the goal state, in, the, in our initial state, um, the solution is the empty plan. But of obviously, this doesn't work in the concrete sp uh, state space because uh, the package is not on the right side. So what we do is we have to dis um, at least distinguish between is the package on the right side or is it not. So we do a split here, and now we have two abstract states. Then uh, we search for an abstract solution again, which is to uh, unload the package in B. But it fails in the concrete state space because uh, the package is not in the truck, and the truck is not uh, in location um, B. So again, uh, we s split the state um, into two states. We could have um, separated them horizontally or vertically, but we uh, do a split on the package again. And then we have an abstract solution that is uh, load the package in A, unload it in B. Again, it fails in this um, state. We cannot um, apply this unload in B action in the concrete state space because um, the package is not in the truck. Uh, the, uh, the truck is not in location B. So we split this state into two states. And then uh, the abstract solution is to load the package in A, drive to B, and then unload it in B, and this um, succeeds in the concrete state space, so we're finished. And uh, we already found a solution. If we uh, don't finish in time, we can also stop anywhere in between and uh, just calculate all the goal distances of the abstract states and then use them as a heuristic, as Malte explained. So uh, in a nutshell, just uh, to uh, summarize this again, we uh, start with the causes abstraction, then uh, until we find a concrete solution or if the time runs out, uh, we find an abstract solution, check if and why it fails in the uh, concrete state space, and then we find the abstraction. And as you uh, probably noticed, <laughs> what we are left with is a Cartesian abstraction. And Cartesian abstractions, as Malte uh, showed you visually, um, is an abstraction um, or a set of states is called Cartesian if for um, every variable we choose a subset of its possible values and then we um, compu uh, compute the Cartesian product of these values to uh, get the state. And if there are only such states in the abstraction, we call the abstraction Cartesian. And uh, what this means visually um, is that you're allowed to split horizontally and vertically, but um, con uh, in contrast to domain abstraction, you don't have to uh, make these splits the, uh, the whole way through, but you can do it um, very locally. And this is very important uh, for uh, the cigar approach. Let me uh, illustrate this point. Um, so we have these classes of, of abstractions. And you may be asking yourselves, why do you have to uh, use Cartesian abstraction for these, um, for the counterexample guided abstraction refinement? Well, if we were to use pattern databases, um, we would uh, quickly get the mu uh, much too many states because each refinement um, if at least doubles the number of states because each time um, each variable has at least two, uh, two values. And um, the refinement is not uh, local enough. Um, the same thing holds for domain abstractions, um, where we also cannot um, separate states locally enough. Um, Cartesian abstractions, on the other hand, give us the possibility to do um, a very fine-grained uh, refinement. And they support the necessary operations, um, like um, 
computing uh, which uh, states are connected um, by an operator in the abstract state space or regressing over abstract states very quickly. And um, therefore, they are the, um, the best uh, match for cigar abstraction. Merchant shrink abstractions um, th that uh, are even more powerful than Cartesian abstractions, but um, computing which concrete states belong to an abstract state um, is difficult and uh, therefore we cannot use them um, for the uh, refinement procedure. And um, as an illustration, we can um, look at how the number of abstract states um, changes or and influences the uh, and which heuristic value for the initial state we can achieve with growing numbers of abstract states. So we have the perfect heuristic um, over here. And um, the cigar approach uh, very uh, slowly increases uh, the uh, the number uh, the initial state value. Um, in contrast to that, the um, PDB heuristic can only ab um, obtain a higher um, heuristic estimate when um, it is allowed to use much more uh, states. So um, you see, this is the fine-grained um, refinement, and this is a more uh, a coarser refinement. Okay, um, the drawback of using um, Cartesian abstractions or uh, of using um, the cigar approach is that it takes longer and longer until you improve your heuristic estimate because each time you have um, to find a solution and to prove that it doesn't work and these solutions grow longer and longer and uh, solving uh, these tasks takes time. Also a problem is that um, e uh, the goal facts are considered one after another. So if you had multiple packages, you would uh, solve the subproblem for one package first, then for the second one. And um, this takes time. And you, uh, you sometimes you never take into account some goal facts if the time runs out before that. Also, um, the resulting abstractions are more informed in the uh, regions that are close to optimal solutions. Um, and this is a drawback because uh, during search, the uninformed regions, uh, regions will have lower heuristic estimates sometimes, and then um, these states might be preferred. So one solution uh, to the all of these problems is to use, um, instead of one single heuristic, one single abstraction, you use multiple abstractions. And this is uh, the second part of my talk. Um, if you have uh, multiple abstractions, <laughs> the question becomes, how can we combine the heuristic estimates? So uh, let's consider these two abstractions. We have um, four abstract states here and two abstract states here. And um, the heuristic estimate is four in this abstraction and five in this abstraction for the initial state. But how do we com combine these estimates? We could use the maximum for the initial state, um, which would give us a value of five. But the question is, can we combine them um, uh, admissibly but, um, e um, and even um, obtain a higher value. And to do that, we can use cost partitioning. And um, a cost partitioning uh, works in the way that um, you imagine yourself copy uh, making copies of a task, and then for each task, you use a separate cost function. Um, and you make sure that uh, each op um, some of the operator costs of these cost functions does not exceed the original um, cost value for this operator. And uh, what we can do in this example here is we can um, we see that operator 1 is responsible uh, for the heuristic value of 5 here. So we count its value in this abstraction um, completely. We say it costs 5. Uh, this cost function has um, the value of 5 for this operator. And um, we say that, that it's a free here, so we use all the its costs in this abstraction, make it free here, and um, what this uh, does is that we have a heuristic value of zero here because these two edges are now free, and um, the overall heuristic estimate for the initial state is zero plus five, which is five. So uh, we didn't uh, gain anything, but um, this lays the basis of the next concept I want to introduce which is uh, the saturated cost partitioning. And this is a neat concept, I think, um, that 
uh, uses the fact that we don't actually sometimes need all the costs in uh, all abstractions. So, um, for example, before I explain um, this above, we say uh, we see that um, we need uh, five uh, a cost of five here to um, achieve this uh, this estimate, but um, here. Uh, these uh, these costs of five are not actually needed because this is not uh, this doesn't lie on uh, on any shortest path. The shortest path um, here is to go over O2 and then over O3. Um, so if we reduced this cost from um, five to three here, uh, we don't lose any heuristic uh, um, any heuristic information. So uh, we can do this. We reduce um, the cost to three here. And this uh, lets us use the remaining costs in the um, in the other abstract abstraction. So this would give us um, a total estimate of four plus two in equals six. So we uh, we are more informed in this abstraction. And um, overall, what we do is for each transition in the tran um, for each uh, operator in the transition system, we uh, see. Um, what is the uh, the cost that we actually need to um, to prove uh, the heuristic estimates, and uh, we maximize uh, uh, maximize uh, with zero, and we use the maximum um, cost that we need. And uh, you will see in the next tutorial, so um, uh, you sh you should definitely stay here, um, and uh, the guys will tell you that um, maximizing with zero is not actually needed, and we can also use negative costs in the cost partitioning. Okay, uh, what is interesting is that uh, this saturated cost function is the minimum uh, distance-preserving cost function, and um, so it always gives us the minimum costs that we need to prove all the heuristic estimates, and um, we will now see how we can um, apply the uh, saturated cost function to the abstraction that we found, then um, uh, keep all the costs that we really need in this abstraction and use the remaining costs in the other abs abstraction. So um, if we have this technique, uh, what do we do about the um, cigar abstractions? We could, in principle, just build uh, n abstractions and uh, use this saturated cost partitioning uh, to um, divide the costs without any changes to the cigar algorithm. But the problem is that the abstractions um, are too similar. And so there is no improvement um, in the heuristic value if we um, use multiple abstractions. The solution um, to this problem is to diversify the uh, um, abstractions. And we um, uh, propose two different um, diversification mechanisms. One is called abstraction by goals. And in this one, we build an abstraction for each goal fact. So each abstraction um, just has one single goal fact, and it le lets the abstraction focus on the different sub-problems. And this works uh, very well, but it has the uh, drawback that, in principle, every task can be reformulated to only have one single goal. So uh, we need something more um, informed than that. And we came up with uh, the abstraction by landmarks mechanism, which computes um, the set of fact landmarks of a task. So the facts that you have to reach in every plan. And then we build an abstraction for each of these fact landmarks. Um, again, there is a problem in this approach, uh, because landmarks um, cannot, we cannot simply set a landmark as a goal and still be admissible because a landmark might be achieved several times um, in a uh, plan. And therefore, we have to, um, in the abstraction that counts the, um, uh, that focuses on this landmark, L, we have to um, set the heuristic estimates to zero if the landmark might have been achieved. So the usual way of doing this uh, in the landmark heuristics is to make them path dependent and to remember which landmarks um, have I already achieved and not to count them um, again. But uh, we want to use a, a state-based criterion. So um, given a state without uh, information about its path, uh, we can decide um, 
if we um, can be sure that we haven't reached the landmark before. And we do this by uh, computing a possibly before set, um, which is the uh, set of facts, the set of facts that um, must be achieved before um, we can um, reach the f uh, the landmark for the first time. Okay. Um, this procedure, the possibly before set, is um, part of um, uh, a task modification that we do for this effect landmark. So to um, compute a, an abstraction for this landmark, we modify the task by first computing the possibly before set. And then we set the set, set of facts for this task as the facts that can be achieved before we achieve the landmark for the first time um, and the landmark itself. We set L to be uh, the only goal. And then we discard all the operators that um, can only be applied after reaching the landmark for the first time. And we let all the operators that achieve the landmark only achieve the landmark. So we don't um, land behind uh, this landmark. And we leave the initial state unmodified. And um, as, as I said, we count um, all the heuristic estimates as zero if we uh, cannot be sure that L, L hasn't, be reached, hasn't been reached. Okay, so we have this procedure now um, where we can compute an abstraction for an a landmark. But, um, and we did this to um, focus on different parts of the um, search sp space in each abstraction. But consider the case that we have this simple task where we have um, x uh, equals 0, 1, and 2. And um, obviously, uh, these uh, two are landmarks, x equals 2 and x equals 1. So we would build an abstraction for e each of these two um, landmarks. And um, when we build uh, an abstraction for x equals 1, uh, we would focus on this part of the search space. And uh, when we build an abstraction for this fact, we would focus on the whole state space. So we uh, focus on this part twice. And we don't want to do this. Um, so we um, do uh, the following solution. We compute some ordering on the landmarks. Um, so we know that um, x equals 1 has to be achieved before x equals 2. And then we combine all the facts for each variable um, that have to be achieved before we achieve the, the landmark that we are considering now. So uh, in a little more uh, complicated um, example, uh, these are the landmarks. And the uh, arrows denote the, uh, the ordering of the landmarks. And now when we build an abstraction for the landmark x equals 1, for this one, we would combine x uh, y equals 0 and y equals 1 into uh, 1. Um, uh, we would use domain abstraction actually for this. So we don't um, do the, uh, the part between these two uh, twice. Also for x equals 2, we would see that um, we have to uh, have, have achieved these two before anyways. So we would combine these two and um, the, the y value values as well. Okay, um, to give you some pointers, uh, if you want to uh, read up on, on this, the original method, the counterexample guided abstraction refinement, uh, was proposed for model checking by Clark at Ali at CAF in 2000. And in ICAPS uh, 2013, we proposed to use Cartesian um, cigar for planning. And uh, the latest additions, the diversification and um, the additive Cartesian abstractions were introduced in ICAPS 2014. Okay, so in conclusion, we have seen that Cartesian abstractions are useful for counterexample guided abstraction refinement. And we saw that uh, saturated cost partitioning can be used to um, compute the minimum costs that we need in one abstraction and uh, re uh, use the remaining costs in the other abstractions. And we also saw how we can diversify a task um, into different subtasks and let the abstractions focus on different um, subtasks. Thank you.
All right. So let's go on with the uh, third and and last part about um, in this tutorial before multiple conclude. So um, this is about merge and shrink abstractions, and um, I will mainly focus in the first part on how we actually compute these merge and shrink abstractions. So this will take quite some while, and then towards the end we will have a look at the more recent shrinking and merging strategies that have been used in, in planning for merge and shrink. So let's start with merge and shrink abstractions. Um, the main idea, as we have seen now in, in both of the talks, is that we do not um, restrict ourselves to some uh, variables like the PDBs do, but we always perfectly, um, not, not perfectly, but always reflect all state variables, but in a potentially lossy way. So we may arbitrarily combine any values of any, of any variables, but of course we cannot, we cannot um, remain perfect. In theory, um, we can uh, um, represent arbitrary abstractions, as Malte said already. And in practice, this is not so simple, of course, because um, that these would be growing too large. And we would also need to come up with, this, with a, a method of how to design these abstractions, actually. And just a brief remark, I won't discuss how we actually use the merge and shrink abstractions as a heuristic in this tutorial which is also not, not as trivial as for PDBs, for example, where you just um, pro um, project out all variables which are not part of your pattern. For merge and shrink, this is a bit more difficult, not really difficult, but um, Malte will give a talk on Thursday about the representational power of nonlinear merge and shrink, and I assume there will be some examples for these uh, merge and shrink tables. So let's focus about the construction, about the algorithm. And now we are coming back to the uh, example we had in the first part already. So the simple logistics um, task which with one package and two trucks. So this is the formal, uh, the formal um, version of this, of this planning task. So we have seen already the, the entire state space. We have three variables, one for the package, um, one for each truck A and B. The package can be either at, at locations left or right or, or in one of the trucks. The trucks can move between L and R. Uh, we want to transport the package from the left to the right location. And we have a bunch of actions to do so. Um, so we can pick up a package at either of the locations with either of the trucks. We can also drop the package in, in the same way. And we can move the trucks between the, between the locations. And this time we will need the labels in our um, pictures. So because those actions are quite long to write, we use abbreviations as follows. So MALR, for example, stands for the action um, which moves the truck from uh, truck A from left to right. DAR stands for drop package from truck A at the right location, etc. And we may also uh, use wildcards to combine several um, labels for the same transition. So we use um, MA wildcard wildcard for both of the move truck A actions. I, I think this should be self-explanatory if you see it. And so we will now in the following discuss all the merge and shrink operations just by going um, through them, one after each other, and with the help of these examples. So we start by computing um, a set of, of um, transition systems by performing the atomic projections on all the single variables of our planning tasks. So this is a simple PDB, if you, if you will. So we uh, pro project out all other variables then the variable we project onto. And then we maintain this set X of, of transition systems, which is a compact representation for the original planning task. And we are now going to modify this set until we decide to stop and use the resulting transition system as a heuristic. All right, let's, let's uh, start with the initialization step, so with computing the atomic projections. Um, this is the atomic projection uh, for the package variable. So we have the four, four states corresponding to the four values of the variable, so the package can be either at location left or right, or in the truck A and B. And this time we also have the labels, so you see that the move actions, all the move actions induce self loops at all the locations, because the move actions do not actually change the value of the, of the package variable. And we can, well, for instance, we can go from, from the package being at the li um, left locations to being in the truck if we apply the pick up truck A load action. Um, sorry, the pick up a at the, le at the left location action. And uh, similarly, oh sorry, I forgot to mention, so the blue states, I don't know if you can really see it, are goal states. 
the white, actually yellow ones, are the regular states, and this is the initial state if there is an incoming edge from the nowhere. All right, so let's go on with the atomic projection for the truck A, um, which is even simpler. So the only, the only actions affecting this variable are the move truck A actions, either from left to right or from right to left. Both states are goal states because the goal does not specify um, anything about the truck A variable, and all the other actions induce self loops. With the pick up, drop, and um, truck A actions, we need to be careful if they are applicable, so they are not always inducing self loops. And I left out the pro um, atomic projection for the truck B because it's just the same with um, A's and B's being swapped. So right now, our, our set X contains these three atomic projections. So one for the package and each one for the, for the trucks. And before we continue now, we need to have a look at this definition of a synchronized product. So we now have this set X. They all have the, uh, this, um, a common set of labels L. And we may now take two of them and compute a synchronized product. And this works as follows. Um, the, the, tr the transition system, which is the resulting product, um, has as a, uh, as a set of states, is just a product of the set of states of the two uh, component transition systems. And more interestingly, the transitions. So these are synchronized. That's why it's called synchronized product. So we have a, we have a um, transition in the product with a label L from the product state S1, S2 to the product state T1, T2, if there are the two corresponding transitions with the same label in each of the components. So if we can go with label L from state S1 to S2 in one of the transitions and from um, S2 to T1 in the other transition system. All right? And the initial state is just a product of the two initial states, and the product state is a goal state if both of its component states were goal states before. And the following um, result is, is very important. So it states that if we were to compute the iteratively the product of all our atomic projections, we would end up again with the original state space. So um, that means that we do not lose any precision by performing this, um, this synchronized product operation. And the merging step as defined in merging string is now actually, as you could guess, just to compute this um, synchronized product. So we take two transition systems. We compute the product and we replace it in our current set X. So we drop the old transition system and we take in the new one. And this, uh, let's have a look at how this works in practice. So we, so we go back to our two atomic transition system, here for the package, here for the truck A, and we want to compute the product, and the result is that one. So we have eight states because we have four times two states of the two transition systems. And let's have a look at how we, um, how we compute such states. So for example, if we combine state A in, in the package transition system with state L in the truck transition system, we end up with the state AL in the product. Um, similarly, if, if, we, if we combine both initial states, we have a new initial state LR. If we combine two goal states, then we end up with a new goal state, here highlighted with RL. And again, more importantly, the transition. So um, for every label, um, we need to check if a label induces transitions in both of the transition system, and if this is the case, then we will have also a synchronized transition in the product. So if we can go from state L to A with the label PAL, and at the same time we stay in the state L in the truck transition system with the same label PAL, this means that we have an induced transition in our product. So we can go from the product state LL with that label PAL to the product state AL. All right. So this is, this is merging, and, and this is, um, as we will see in the following result, this is a so-called exact operation, which means it is somehow perfect. It is information preserving, as we discussed before. And this is because it preserves goal states, transitions, and label costs. So the latter two are, are quite um, simple to understand. We, we do not modify the label cost. We do not modify transitions, and we just um, keep their synchronization behavior intact. And the goal states um, are preserved. That means that if a concrete state is, is um, um, if a concrete goal state is mapped to goal states before in, in all of the transition systems, uh, and especially in the two we merged, then it will also be mapped to goal states afterwards. So we, we preserve the structure of the graph, modulo um, renaming states. All right. So in theory, we could now merge and merge and merge, but at sometimes it, these will grow too large, these transition systems. So we 
may need to shrink the, their sizes. And this is where the abstraction come into play. So this is just a repetition from before. An abstraction of a transition system is an arbitrary function applied on, on, on the states. And it is usually used to reduce the size. So we map on a smaller set of states. And shrinking means just to apply such an arbitrary abstraction on any of our transition system in our current, sex, um, current set X of, of transition systems. And let's have a quick look at an example. So we continue with the product we just computed before. And now, for instance, we want to combine the two goal states into a single one because we don't care in which goal state we actually end up. So what happens if that we have a new state afterwards and we need to take care of the transitions? So we will see that all the transitions which are self-loops at one of the two states already, they remain self-loops in the new state. All the transitions which, which happen between the two states become self-loops in the new, um, new go state. And all the incoming um, transitions and outgoing transitions, they must be remapped to the new state. So this is, this is really simple. And the, the, the result looks like this. And we can repeat this process by combining more states until we are satisfied with, with the size of our transition system. All right. And then we have the following. So it shouldn't be surprising that shrinking is not an exact operation. So by, by arbitrarily combining states, we, of course, lose information. Um, we may introduce shortcuts in our transition system. But it's important to notice that it is a safe op operation in that it means that it preserves goal states, again, as before. Um, we do not change label costs. So we may not increase any paths in our uh, transition system. Yes, you have a question. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You have both of them. So we will just keep all the transitions. So this um this means that shrinking may introduce some kind of non-determinism in the in the resulting transition system. So you can either stay at the same location with that transition or you can go somewhere else. All right. Sorry? Yes, yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you have to keep it. Yeah. Yes, and it returns to the perfect one of the, the original, thing. exactly. All right, so shrinking is safe. And so uh, I already mentioned we may introduce shortcuts by, by combining states. But it is important we may not introduce Boolean transitions, so we may not increase path length. So this is still useful for the resulting heuristic being admissible and being used in, in, combine, um, in a, a star search. All right, so the last operation is the so-called label reduction, which has last year been uh, generalized to the generalized label reduction. And um, so this works quite similarly as shrinking, but not, uh, not on the set of states of a transition system, but on the common label set L of all the transition systems. So it means that label reduction is just a mapping defined on the set L of labels, which maps to some other set L prime, let's say. And again, also here, we, we usually want to use it to reduce the size of labels. So we, we want to combine several labels into a new one. And we have to, um, we have to keep in mind that we, um, that we uh, respect this condition so that we, if we combine several, um, if we map a label onto a new label, we do not increase its cost. And this is this, the single condition for label reduction to being a, a safe operation already. So even if we would, even if we, if we were to combine all labels into a single label, um, this is still safe. So we would introduce lots of shortcuts in the in the resulting uh, synchronized product, but um, this wouldn't um, overestimate our our total distance. And more interestingly, we can make label reduction become an exact operation if if we use the following criteria. So first, um, we call two or more labels locally equivalent in a given transition system theta in our set X, if they label the exact same set of transitions. So they only induce parallel arcs everywhere they occur. And if we now find label, uh, two or more labels that are uh, locally equivalent in all our transition systems, except for maybe one transition system theta, then we call these labels theta combinable for that transition system where they do not have to be um, locally equivalent. All right, and. We will see in a minute how this works in, an, in, an in the example, but um, let me take the result. 
already. So if, if we base label reduction on the criterion of theta combinability, that means that this label reduction is safe. So um, if we only combine labels which are theta combinable for any transition system in our current set X of transition system, we do not lose any information. This is maybe not, not so intuitive. Let's have a quick um, look at an example. So we go back to the initial situation where we had our three, three uh, atomic transition systems. And we're now looking for two labels which we can um, combine without losing information. And so consider those two labels, PAL and DAL. We see that in the first tr um, transition system for the package, they are definitely not locally equivalent because they label different transitions. But for the two um, atomic transition systems for the truck variables, we see that they only occur at the same transition. So here at this, at, at this left location and here two self loops in the left and right location. And this means that these two labels are now package combinable for the variable package. And this means that we can replace them and combine them into an arbitrary new symbol, so some, something um, like X. And if we were now to merge these two transition systems again, as we did before, so the package with the truck A, we would um, come up with the exact same graph, with the exception that all the labels PAL and DAL would be replaced by X. But the structure would be the same, so all the paths would be the same. We would not lose any information in that graph. This is why label reduction is exact in, this, in, in that way. All right, so let, let us summarize with the merge and shrink algorithm. So we have discussed that we start um, by initializing our set X with all the atomic projections, and then we iteratively apply the following steps until we have only one transition system left. So we may at actually at any point decide to apply exact label reduction. I just put it first here to not interfere with the rest, but it doesn't matter when we do it because it, as we have seen, is an exact operation. Then we must at some point decide which transition systems we want to merge next, so theta 1 and theta 2. And then, this is new, before actually merging, we check if, if the product of their sizes exceeds some self-imposed size limit k. And if that is the case, we decide to shrink one or both of them so that the product um, remains un um, below that bound. And then we actually before, um, performed the merging operation by replacing those two transition systems with the synchronized product. And we do this until we have one left, and then we return this transition system, which is then if we apply shrinking in between is an abstraction of the original state space, and if we manage to do so without shrinking, it could be actually the original state space, or at least um, isomorph to this one. And so there are a few questions here that remain open. So how do we choose k? Well, in practice, just according to our memory limits. And how do we select uh, the next transition system to merge? We will discuss this at the end when looking at merging strategies. And how do we shrink? There are a bunch of shrinking strategies we will, which we will be discussing right now. So um, the original strategy um, is called F-preserving shrinking, introduced in the first um, paper about merge and shrink in planning. And the idea is that we repeatedly combine states with the same G and um, H value, so they have the same F value. And we prefer such states that have a high F value. And the idea is that we um, only combine states and hence only possibly lose information in areas which, which we may not actually lead, need during a star search because high F values means that, um, well, we, if we find a shorter path, we do not need to have a look at those states. And more recently, and actually still state of the art, is the shrinking strategy based on bi-simulation. A bi-simulation for a, a transition system theta is an equivalence relation on its states S. So, and we say that um, if, if two states S, S and T are um, equivalent in under bi-simulation, they must um, fulfill those two criteria. So they must, uh, it must hold that either both states are goal states or none of those states are goal states. And it means that there, if there is a transition with label L from, from the one state to some state S prime and from the other state T to some um, state T prime, then those two states reachable with the same label must also be bisimilar. So the bisimulation somehow preserves the reachability in the, in the transition system. And well, shrinking based on bisimulation simply combines bisimilar, um, bisimilar states. And it's interesting to note that bisimulation is actually an exact shrinking criterion if we manage to compute the full bisimulation on our transition system, which is in practice 
um, usually not, well, sometimes not feasible because our um, imposed size limit may not allow to compute the by simulation which is smaller than that size limit. So we need to approximate it and then again shrinking is not exact but it's still, it is still safe. All right, and now a brief look to the merging strategies. Well, we have still plenty of time. <laughs> um, so the original merging strategies proposed for planning were all uh, linear merging strategies, most mostly based on a pre-computed order of variables, some of them also on a dynamic linear order of variables. And linear means that we start by uh, computing the synchronized product of two atomic transition systems and then go through the re um, remaining atomic transition systems and merge them in one after the other. And so we only have to maintain one large transition system at a time and we m only apply a shrinking to, to this one large transition system from time to time and then we well, finally end up with, with this one large transition system. And um, more recently um, there were the first nonlinear merging strategies proposed because earlier on this was not um, well, efficiently possible with the old label reduction, but with the uh, generalized label reduction, it is now possible. And the first one proposed was uh, called DFP, um, named by the original authors of, of Merchant Shrink, Draga, Finkelbeiner, and Podolsky. And the idea there is that um, we preferably, preferably merge transition systems which have uh, which share labels that induce in both those transition systems transitions close to the goal states. And the idea is similar to the shrinking strategy we have seen again before to build a fine grained abstraction ar around the goal states and probably less fine-grained far away from goal states. With the idea that we might not um, need to, to actually use the values of, of the states far away from goals. And there's another one I want briefly to mention. It's called um, Miasm or Miasm, I don't know. And here the idea is that um, we merge the transition systems such, such that the product at some point contain many unreachable or irrelevant states. And I didn't mention this, but in practice we, at every point when we, uh, when we modify any of the tra transition systems, we throw away all states which are unreachable or irrelevant because it, they don't matter for our uh, heuristic evaluation later on. So and this, this strategy aims at merging in such a way that many of these states become unreachable and irrelevant so we can throw them away without losing information. All right. And there's um, one final nonlinear merging strategy I want to have a, a look at in slightly more detail, which is based on uh, factor symmetries. So we um, we consider sy um, symmetries that work on the set X of our um, transition systems, and these symmetries are simply a, a permutation of states and labels. So um, states are mapped; um, they preserve the structure in that they map only states to states and labels to labels, and if a state is symmetrical to some other state, that means that their um, incoming and outgoming edges must, must also be mapped accordingly to the um, symmetrical labels, and they must reach the same symmetrical states. And so that means that all path costs are again preserved, and, and um, we consider a special case of those factored symmetries called local factored symmetries, and we say that such, such a symmetry is local if it does not map any states from one transition system with states to an, um, of another one. So it just um, affects probably m many of those transition systems, but not across them. And we use this to design a, a merging strategy as follows. So we compute such a symmetry. It has to affect at least two or more transition systems. And then the idea is that by merging all the affected transition system into one larger one, then the resulting symmetry becomes atomic in that it only affects the resulting product of the, of the merged transition systems. And why is that useful? It is useful for two reasons. Um, first, if we now were to shrink based on these atomic symmetries, we would not lose any information. So by combining symmetrical states in this one product of our um, transition systems, we do not lose any information. And even better, we do not need to bother how we how we compute the, um, the shrinking based on symmetries because um, by simulation, which is the state of the art shrinking strategy, in combination with label reduction automatically takes care of that. So by simulation is a more general criterion than, than, um, than symmetry in that case. So we just use merging in order to allow by simulation to be applied without losing information. All right, so um, 
let's have a brief look at the literature of merge and shrink. So the original paper stems uh, from the model checking area as, as the CIGAR. So uh, Drager and others um, proposed this in 2006. One year later, um, Malte Helmert and others um, adapted it to planning and they proposed the F-preserving shrinking strategy and the linear merging strategies um, based on, on, on causal graph criteria most of the time. And four, four years later, Nisim and others uh, proposed the bi-simulation based shrinking, which is still up to date the, the best uh, shrinking strategy in, in use. Um, in the two following years, Edelkamp and others and Toralba and others um, adapted merchant shrink to the symbolic case, so for symbolic A star search. And in 2014, um, combination of the authors from before, wrote an overview journal paper of the existing merchant shrink approaches and it seemed at that point um, that that merchant shrink was somehow well 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 um, well established and everything was known but then um, we came up with the generalized labor reduction and the um, and the nonlinear um, merging strategy DFP in 2014 in the same year and based on that um, Fenn and Holti also um, devised the Miasm nonlinear merging strategy and also others continued working on merchant shrink. Hoffman and others um, used merchant shrink for detecting unsolvability. And this year in AAAI, we proposed a symmetry-based merchant strategy we just discussed. And it is still going on. So at this conference, you will have the opportunity to attend three talks that have to do something with merchant shrink. The first one being given tomorrow um, by Alvaro sitting over there. Um, in the HS Dip workshop, where, they pre where, where he presents um, their paper on simulation-based admissible dominance pruning, a Nitschke paper, where they use merchant shrink to devise some um, criterion which they then use for pruning a star search. And as I mentioned before, Malte will give a talk on, on Tuesday on the expressive power of nonlinear merchant shrink representations, where he will also speak about how we use merchant shrink abstractions um, as heuristics or as functions in more general. And then finally, on Thursday, in the joint session with SOX, um, Again, Alvaro probably will talk about um, about their work um, on focusing on what really matters, irrelevance pruning in merge and shrink, where they use the technique from the Ishkai paper to actually also enhance merge and shrink heuristics. All right, and that's it. So back to Malte. Okay. Thank you, Simon. Okay, so let's wrap up. I always forget what the right key is, especially as it's a new computer. Okay. You wonder why it matters which kind of computer it is, but this one makes it more difficult to press the function keys. Okay. So, um, yeah, what, we want to, what I want to do um, in, in this last part is basically summarize very briefly what we've talked about, kind of also to put it a little bit in, in, in context, um, and then say what else is out there that we didn't talk about, because uh, obviously that was just a small selection of trop uh, topics and abstraction heuristics. As you saw, our names showed up all the time. So course we mainly showcase the things that we have been doing um, I should admit that this, the stuff that works best is not really ours at the moment it's Alvaro stuff so uh, we, we will talk a little bit about that and I should really encourage you to attend those presentation that uh, Sivan mentioned um, but yeah we, we, we talk about that so yeah so this was about abstractions right so abstractions are a principled approach of, of deriving admissible heuristics and the basic idea is um, basically that you try to identify, or you, you don't try to identify, you define states as equivalent. You say, I don't want to distinguish these states anymore. And why would you do that? Because then you have fewer states, uh, and if you have fewer states, it's, it's kind of quite manageable to search through all them, and so you can use that basically to come up in, in, in a rather generic way of, of coming, coming up with, with distance information. Um, we talked about this, this different kinds of abstractions, um, that kind of become successively more general. Of course, they also become successively more complicated, right? So the if this is the first time you ever heard, for example, about merge and shrink, uh, you're very unlikely to have understood every single detail. Um, but um, yeah, that's, I guess, another reason why I, I would really like to point you to the literature. Um, Sylvan, for example, mentioned the, the, the journal paper, which is really a beast, like 70 pages of, of, of theorems and, and notations and, and whatever. Um, and we worked on that for five years. Uh, and then kind of like two months later, we came up with this kind of generalized labor reduction, which is just much simpler, much easier, much more pleasant, and, and kind of makes everything else not, not quite obsolete, but, but certainly made us glad we'd already published it. Um, so uh, 
Merchant Shrink, what I want to say, Merchant Shrink is more accessible than it has ever been. You know, just, just read the AAAI paper uh, that, that is referenced here, then you'll find the reference again on the web if you look for it. Um, and you'll understand easily what we fail to understand properly in seven years of working on it. Um, okay, uh, so we went a bit deeper into the Cartesian abstractions, where abstract states are kind of re rectangular states in a way. They, they kind of uh, abstract uh, the individual variables kind of in whatever way they want, but they can't capture dependencies between the variables within one abstract state. Um, and that makes it particularly easy to use them within a refinement approach because you can really do this refinement, kind of repairing um, um, an abstraction because you realize there's some concrete plan that actually uh, uh, works in the abstraction but not in the concrete. You can really do that by just introducing one more abstract state, just doing one split. That's the nice thing about that. So that's the basis for counter example guided abstraction refinement, which is a quite well established technique, but that can be um, applied very neatly in a very natural, elegant way with these particular kinds of abstractions. And the other aspect that really is something you don't necessarily only have to do in the context of Seagar, that you can do actually with all kinds of things, is this idea of an automatic way of kind of trying to identify different parts of the problem um, that emphasize different subproblems you have to solve and that, that you can then um, treat separately as things you, you, you can build abstractions for. Um, so this is the diversification strategy. Um, and also, of course, the technique for additively combining these heuristic estimates um, through cost saturation. And as, as Jendrik briefly hinted, there will be more on the, on the subject of cost partitioning in the next tutorial, although we will give, go in a, in a quite different direction with it. There will be no abstractions, well, hardly any abstractions in that other tutorial. Um, we also talked about merchant shrink abstractions. So the, the basic idea is uh, that you really take um, your abstractions as kind of, you know, a bit of dough that you can play with, right? So you have your bag of very small abstractions and then you have operations that, that can combine them, that can do stuff to them. Um, it's, it's, it's really like, like a little toolkit for messing around with abstractions um, that gives you a lot of, a lot of power for, for doing all sorts of, all sorts of things. Um, and in particular, it, it strictly generalizes the things that came before. So for example, um, let's say we only merge, we never do anything else. Actually, the kinds of heuristics we get out of that would be pattern databases. The pattern database, the projection, is the heuristic you get if you just merge the set of variables that you want, you care about, and you know, forget about all the others. Um, so that's very general, very flexible. Um, it's actually so flexible that again, in the in the JCM paper, we kind of struggle to really understand what exactly are the things you can do compactly with that, what are the things you can't do compactly with that. So that will be basically the topic. Um, of, of also the, the, the talk that uh, Sivan advertised a few times that will be uh, in the first conference session, I think, that I will, I will be giving on the day after tomorrow. Um, okay, further reading. So there's lots of, lots of other things, but I want to particularly highlight kind of the main areas within abstraction heuristics that we didn't talk about. And of course, kind of the ele elephant in the room is pattern databases. Uh, so even though we always kind of try to, you know, come up with the more general kinds of abstractions that, that are, um, you know, more powerful, can, 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 perfectly represent um, harder problems. Pattern databases are still quite hard to beat because there's so many interesting things that people have done uh, to come up with good ones. So they have quite a long history. They basically revolutionized the state of the art for, for the sliding tile puzzle even more so uh, when they were extended um, to, to become additive. Um, so they were called disjoint uh, PDBs in that paper and in the planning community they're, they're mostly called additive these days, so it's the same thing. So the original works by Colbson and Schaefer and later by Kauf and Ferner. By the way, this kind of looks kind of out of order. If you look at the years, that's because I went with the journal papers, right? So this, for example, is a 2002 journal paper, but it doesn't mean that additive PDBs were invented after they were applied in planning, right? That, that, that's not the case. Um, th so these are kind of the main references to, to look for, not, not the first reference. Um, okay, so this was basically the work that happened uh, before Stefan Edelkamp kind of uh, uh, basically sucked the idea from the heuristic search community and took them to planning. So that happened in 2001. He used PDBs for planning. He also, uh, in the first paper, already used additive PDBs for planning. It was kind of the, by far, best heuristic search approach for optimal planning, or uh, any approach really at that time for optimal planning, um, by a huge margin, only that no one knew, um, because there weren't so many, actually, comparisons of optimal planners around these days, um, or in those days. And yeah, and since then things have only become better, really. So Stefan was the first one to to focus on uh, algorithms for selecting good patterns. Uh, Patrick Haslum and others extended this work, and this is kind of still the state of the art there. I would say the so-called IPDB algorithm for selecting good patterns to use in a pattern database heuristic. 
which is quite interesting in that it's kind of a meta search. You, you search in the space of heuristics to find a good heuristic, and then you use this heuristic for search. Um, and it also came up with a good way uh, of combining multiple um, pattern databases in a way that is admissible and kind of a bit better than the ideas that were around before, or rather maybe formalize them um, kind of in a more precise way to really say, okay, using this additivity criterion, which is the best what that we can do, but it's called the canonical heuristic. Um, yeah, and then we had a paper that mainly focused on uh, implementation aspects, he was at Ali at SOX, um, and uh, a few years back we came up with a way that is kind of better than the best way of combining them from the canonical heuristics in the sense that it gives you a heuristic um, um, estimate that is, uh, dominates the previous one, but there's a, uh, there's a price to pay for that. Um, so here you have the joy of being allowed to try to solve an NP-hard problem, uh, whereas this better heuristic is actually polynomial time computable. So that's kind of, uh, uh, that, was, that was a quite nice result. Um, so actually, um, kind of the, the core of that um, is that the previous heuristic was for some kind of unnecessary reason essentially solving an integer program. And it turns out instead you can solve a linear program. And if you do that, um, you'll be faster because it's easier and actually will, will give you a bit of better heuristic. And that's kind of another pointer towards the next tutorial uh, where we will talk a little bit about that and, and the, the kind of the space of LPs in, in planning more generally. Um, and there's many, many other things, especially in the heuristic search algor uh, algorithm community, uh, heuristic search community, that you can actually just grab and transport into planning. So for example, things like um, compressed pattern databases haven't really been studied in planning. Or um, well, some, some people have done, for example, partial pattern databases now, perimeter pattern databases. Some of these things have been translated, but there are many, many more techniques um, that we know uh, can improve on the thing that we already know works well and that don't really exist in planning yet. Um, <coughs> okay, so the other big topics that we skipped um, are basically uh, those abstractions that don't, that, that, that can kind of get away with not storing the abstraction explicitly. So the ones that don't need to, you know, store a million memory locations for um, representing a million abstract states. And there's kind of two flavors of, of that. Um, the first ones here are the so-called implicit or structural abstractions. So the basic idea here is um, that you can, for example, do something like a projection, um, but you can come up with the shortest distances, like the optimal cost in that projection, without actually searching that space explicitly. And, and you can still do it efficiently with guaranteed efficiency. And the way you can do that is by using particular kinds of projections that have particular properties um, that basically admit efficient search algorithms um, even though there's a large search space. So basically you, you're looking for, or not, not you're looking for, you're specifically creating sub-problems with a particular structure um, that, that makes optimal planning tractable. And then basically your problem of solving the abstract task can either be, be you know, rather than pre-computing all the abstract states, you can't do that because you have too many abstract states, uh, either you kind of compute it on the fly with a tractable algorithm or you kind of pre-compute some of the information that you can then later kind of assemble quickly um, into, into the heuristic estimate. And that's kind of the progression here. So um, you see it's mostly the same names that you know, have, have pushed this technique further and further. So it started basically with the complexity results that showed these are actually tractable subproblems. And then there's a paper that says, and this is how we can use them as an abstraction. And then the paper, I'm, I'm simplifying a bit of course, but, but kind of uh, uh, then said, okay, and this is how you can do it really efficiently. Um, and since then, um, yeah, so if, if you thought, so there's a journal paper again that summarizes all this, and if you thought this was quite complicated, you're wrong. Um, you haven't seen the most recent work on this. Uh, so people have gone and, and, and pushed this further. So this was again Michael Katz, but with a, with a new face in that case, with Emil Kaider, um, who went and, and found actually more general tractable patterns than the ones studied previously. So previously we had what was, what was called forks and um, inverted forks. And now we're looking at slightly larger sub or well kind of problems with a slightly, uh, slightly richer structure called semi-forks and hourglass patterns. And um, yeah, and, and that's... Um, so one, one way of being able to uh, do abstraction into rather large problems and still solve them efficiently. Um, the other way is to do, uh, use what is called symbolic abstractions. And that's a, like an instance of a, a more general mechanism of, well, symbolic state space search, symbolic exploration of state spaces. You still do kind of, you know, your old red first Dijkstra style kind of algorithm, but you don't represent all the states explicitly. Like you use particular data structures that allow you to rep represent a potentially large set of states um, with, with a representation that can be, if you're lucky, exponentially smaller than the number of states it represents. So you can think, for example, 
Um, so what, what is usually used are so-called BDDs, binary decision diagrams, or ADDs, algebraic, uh, algebraic decision diagrams. But you can also think of it as just like a logic, logical formula that represents all the states that satisfy the formula. And the formula can be much smaller than the, the number of states it represents. Um, and, well, and then the, the art or the, 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 the science is in um, basically applying all the, uh, the, the operations we want to do, like you know, doing a breadth first search, doing like an A star search, or maybe doing something like a heuristic lookup, doing all this on the basis of these symbolic representations. And that was started by Stefan Edelkamp when he worked on symbolic PDBs one year after he you know, brought the, the regular explicit state PDBs to planning. Um, and then he, he continued that, so he actually combined it with external search, um, uh, which means you don't just use your RAM, you use your hard disk as well, or these days your, your solid, uh, um, your, your SSD. Um, and um, again, as I said in 2001, uh, this was by far the best heuristic around, but not many people knew it. Um, also with the symbolic PDBs, it wasn't really um, realized by how many people, how much better in many scenarios at least, the ones currently study, commonly studying planning with, with much structure in them, how much better they actually are than the non-symbolic PDBs. Um, so it took someone else, uh, namely among others Rob Polti sitting over there to actually take Stefan's idea and, and show people, wow, this can actually be a factor of thousand or more uh, more compact in quite a few cases than, uh, than the, 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 the usual PDB. Um, and well, after that, there was kind of, a, let, let's say, a second wave of work on symbolic PDBs a few years later, uh, started by, by Stefan Edelkamp, Peter Kissmann, and in particular in the, in the last few years, Alvaro Toralba, um, on taking these symbolic approaches and combining them with what had then been the new state of the art of abstraction risks and planning, in particular combining them with merchant shrink, but also, also with other things like perimeter, uh, perimeter search, bidirectional search, um, uh, invariant analysis, and all other kinds of good things. Um, <coughs> and um, I, so here is, here's the main papers, but if you really want to get into the area, I think that the main reference I would recommend is actually uh, Alvaro's PhD thesis, which was defended this week successfully, um, which basically gives you a lot of context and all, all the good new stuff, and in particular, of course, all the references to the old stuff, and describes uh, the planning system Simba Star that won um, the, the optimal track of the sequential planning competition last year um, without being a portfolio, which is basically impossible. Um, but I mean, if, if you look closely, there's of course, I mean, one, one way of, of beating a portfolio is to combine many ideas in one planner. So there's, there's I guess, Ivo can be blamed of that, but everybody can be blamed of that, right? Um, so it's, it's really only one basic idea, like the symbolic search that drives all this. Um, and works better than the portfolio of, of uh, well, at least on the benchmark set, uh, of all the other sta previous state-of-the-art approaches. Um, OK, I want to close, basically, by, by showing like, some of the things that can still be done, just in case you've got you know, interest in these sorts of things and wonder what, what are people still looking at, right? Where are the open edges? Um, and there's many, many of those. Uh, one, thing, one, one reason why I said that pattern databases, even though Merchant String can really do more, um, why pattern databases are still certainly in some cases at least as good, in some cases better, also worse than others, but still one, one reason why pattern databases work so nicely um, is because we really know how to use them in an additive way. And we haven't really come up with a good way of coming up with additive merchant string heuristics. Um, the main reason why it's more difficult here um, has nothing to do with theory or anything like that. It's, it's just that it's much easier to compute like a bunch of, of pattern database heuristics than a bunch of merchant string heuristics. So they're, they're more complex to work with. They take more time. So you don't want to do something like like we do with PDBs, like you know, generate 10,000 small patterns and, and combine them. You, you have to kind of be a bit more clever about it. And we don't really know how to do that yet. So that's something worth li looking into. Um, another thing wor worth looking into is improve on, on these kind of different decision points we have in all these algorithms. Like in, in CIGAR, um, how to decide how to actually refine. There was this one point in, in Yendrick's example where he said, well, you could do it this way, you can do it that way. Uh, the way we currently do it is, is not really based on uh, five years of, of deep theory. It's, it's basically, okay, this seems to work. Let's go with that. We can't come up with anything better. Um, and same thing with the merge strategy. So there's quite a few of those around, but every time someone looks at that, he's able to improve the previous state of the art by, let's say, 10, 20 problems. So we're really not close to the best that can be done there. With the shrinking strategies, actually, I don't have so many good ideas anymore. The by simulation stuff is really nice. Um, but with the merge strategies, I, I'm, I'm sure more can be done. Um, and another thing, going back to Alvaro's defense, I was quite shocked sitting there 
uh, when, when he talked about like kind of the kind of patterns he uses in his symbolic PDB and he said basically well the, the best ones I know uh, or the best approach we, 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 we tried was just generate a random pattern. Um, maybe I'm simplifying a bit but it was still you know, something along those lines. So um, there's definitely more intelligence that, that I think we can, we can still put into coming up with good patterns for PDB heuristics. So basically work on all these many decision points that we have in these algorithms. Um, Another thing that seems to be quite popular in planning these days is using things not just for finding solutions, but for sh showing that no solutions existed. So Silvan already gave a pointer to that. Um, as far as I know, I mean, there's a question mark that I don't think has really been officially announced yet. Um, but there at least is an idea in the way uh, of, of, of having a competition on you know, planning systems that can prove that problems are unsolvable. There's quite a few applications for that. Um, model checking, for example, is certainly one because unsolvability there basically usually means absence of bugs, which is a nice thing. Um, <coughs> but, but many other cases too, like a robot that can actually tell you, okay, the thing you request of me is not possible. Um, that's, that's a useful feature to have. Um, so this seems to be something that is kind of gathering steam worth working with. And in particular, it seems to be something, if you want to do a heuristics-based approach, you should probably go with, with abstraction heuristics because the other kind of big things that people use in heuristics are for example, delete relaxations, and the delete relaxations are all equally good or equally bad as far as uh, proving something unsolvable is concerned. There's no point in using H plus or HLM cut or, or anything more expensive. They won't give you any infinite estimate that you can't get with the simple H max computation. So of course, um, that's good enough in some cases too, but it's not really clear how to push that further. Um, similarly with landmarks, well, a landmark something has to be true in any plan. How is that going to help you if you want to prove that there is no plan? Um, that certainly may be possible, but it doesn't seem to be all that nat natural. Uh, whereas abstractions are really quite useful for proving that something is unsolvable. All you have to do basically, well I should probably put that in, in quotes, but all you have to do is separate your initial state from the goal and the abstraction, then you're done. Um, okay, so there's great promise for that and to some extent it has already been realized, so um, uh, Jörg Hoffmann and others have already published on that, um, but I'm sure this is only the start of, of um, some, some research in this, this area and, and a lot more can be done there. Um, finally, one, one thing I'm always a bit worried about, like when talking to people, I see a few people here are more from the heuristic search community than the planning community, um, is that we always only apply this in classical planning. Of course, we care a lot about classical planning, um, but there's many people who just want to solve their problem in the best possible way. And I'm sure there are many problems where you can use things like Merchant Shrink, for example, um, and improve of, of current approaches that are based on pattern databases. For example, if you look at multiple sequence alignment, uh, the heuristics used there are, are kind of pattern databases in a way. So you look at a fragment of, of the sequences you have to align, and they're really limited in terms of the number of sequences you can look at because of the, the, the combinatorial explosion you can have. And, and surely there are many abstract states there that are far off the optimal, uh, optimal alignment. So you should really, really use merchant string there. Um, and the only reason why we haven't done that yet is, of course, because it's a lot of work. So uh, please, you do it, and then we can write in our papers that this approach works brilliantly for things other than uh, classical planning. Um, okay, so there's definitely lots more to do there, and uh, that's really why we wanted to give you uh, this tutorial, because we think there have been quite interesting developments in this area recently, and it, there's, there's many places where you can pick off and take it further. Um, so that's kind of the message we want to leave you with. Uh, so that's all for us, and thank you for your attention. Thank you.